you know, we're, we're used to, you know, coming out and, you know, happy, probably, you know, and, but it's important. This is important to talk about, and I think um, all of these things touch, you know, um, every cell in our bodies, and it just, it, uh, they make us feel something, and, and if we can share together, and um, because all of us have felt some of these um, feelings before, whether it's um, just deep depression or just a sad blues, you know, or, or to the extent of wanting to, you know, kill yourself. You know, we've all felt this or had people that have felt it. So I think the conversation is important, especially in spiritual community where we care about each other, you know, and um, where we can come together and not isolate. So that's why we wanted to do this. And, and right. especially because we, with Robin Williams, when that happened, I just got home from um, vacation and you were in here. And I came in and I went, oh, <laughs> and I was crying. And I, when I, I used to don't cry when that this kind of stuff happens to somebody I don't know. I feel bad and pray, but I just I really felt this sadness. And Judy said, "Oh my God, my whole family felt it too." So we started talking about this, and, and that's why we decided that maybe other people felt like we did, and that we should talk about it. I think so. First of all, let's let's collect. Um, if you have written a question for us to entertain today, please pass it to the center, and Stacy will uh, pick them up. If anybody has questions about these things. And, uh, you know, one of the reasons that we picked, uh, that we wanted to talk about this is because this is something that touches all of us. And I think that when, uh, you know, I was thinking back about um, Princess Diana and John Lennon and Martin Luther King yeah. and John Kennedy and Robert Kennedy and Whitney Houston and now, you know, oh. Robin Williams takes his own life. But I think for me, and I can only speak from my own personal experience, when a life is cut short for any reason, and the, and the light that that person, that human being, brought to the world is snuffed out unexpectedly or prematurely or in a difficult, shattering way that it's, like stuns us. Um, and of course it happens in our own families. How many of us have lost people that we love deeply in these ways. I think that what, for me, what happens is there's this personal awareness of how precious life is. And we see in these, these individuals, especially these people that have high profile um, exposure in this digital age, we see the qualities in these people mm -hmm. of you know, the creative talent, the beauty, the grace, the laughter, the capacity to bring this incredible energy of life to life. And when that goes, it like it's stunning, it's shocking, it hurts us at a deep core level that reminds us of our own vulnerability. Yeah. I think that's what it's about. It reminds us of our own vulnerability and it and it it's it's very difficult, or the vulnerability of people that we love. And so it, it touches all of us on one level or another. It, it does remind us of the, the, how fragile life is, you know. And I love, you know, in the, the um, song, it was that, you know, our song, it's like someone's song cut short, because that's what we are. Our life is a song, you know, to the universe. And, um, you know, it's, it's a, it, it does touch us deeply. So, um, you know, um, I, I got to. I don't want to go through this too much, but this is kind of important to know that approximately 108 Americans take their life, um, their own life, every day, um, and that 90% of all people who die by suicide have a diagnosable psychiatric disorder at the time of their death, and that there's four male suicides for every female suicide, but three times as many females as males attempt suicide. Isn't that interesting? You know. Wow. Um, yeah. yeah. One of the things that, that struck me as I was um, uh, working with preparation for this talk is, is referring back to the TED talk that I watched. And uh, be, I used this image behind us today, Pandora's box. Remember this, the myth of Pandora's box? Remember how it was, don't open this box, you're going to let all the evils out. Well, well, the sergeant tells the story of a young man who was... Uh, had actually traveled several times to the Golden Gate Bridge to attempt suicide, changed his mind every time, and finally this is the time that, that Sergeant Briggs encountered him, and 
the young man said, remember that story about Pandora's box? And how when, when she opened it up, all the stuff flew out. And then you know at the end, how hope was the last remaining quality? And he said to the sergeant, what do you do if there's no hope in the box? Ooh. And then he shook the sergeant's hand and said, I'm sorry, I have to go, and jumped off. It was one of the three suicides that the, um, that the uh, sergeant encountered during his time there. And so this idea of hopelessness, hope, this, this capacity to see the light in our experiences, I think is really important. And for me, this is the antidote to what we're talking about. So how do we how do we touch that in ourselves? How do we in, kindle that in each other when we're suffering? To me, that's a big question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay. Shall we just start taking some of sure. that, some of these sure. um, what people are asking? And because I think we all have these questions. Mm -hmm. um, I have one here that says, "Why do some souls feel that suicide is even an option?" You know. I mean, why do we even think that? You know. Um, and, and I think because, at least I would say, you know, that that maybe they think the pain will stop. You know, if there's so much pain or so much grayness, you know, they, it, it's an emotional that um, time where maybe they just feel it'll stop. Uh, and will it stop? I don't, you know, I mean, I don't know. That's another question, you know, another question we can ask. Does it, you know, and I, we were talking about that ourselves. Does the pain that you're feeling really stop? And... I think, Judy, you, you said something that I thought was interesting, that we are, we just are, and we go on. So why do we think that that, that necessarily will happen? Yeah, well, the thing is, we, we were doing some research, and Glenda uh, brought to mind the, the Hamlet reading, to be or not to be. Well, in my way of thinking, there's no way not to be. See, we are. We are that spark of the divine, no matter how it shows up. We're it, right? Whether we are, whether we're, in this body or not, we are. If we believe what we say, that we are a spark of, of the divinity that, that God is, this vibration of the universe, we're just, you know, sort of manifested right now in this particular form. So the idea of thinking that um, it's over when it's when we choose well, I'm done. When, when our bodies are I'm done. done. I'm getting off this I'm getting off this this wheel. Um, I, I don't think you can, because we are. Now this is where I probably differ from a lot of people, and this is the great grace of this community because we don't have to believe anything, right? I don't know what happens next. I don't know if pain ends or continues. I don't know what it looks like. That's my thing. Many traditions will tell us what it looks like. Many traditions will tell us what the next thing looks like. I personally don't know. All I know is that I'm that, I am that, I'm always that, whether I'm in a body or not, I'm going to be that. And so this, it, it, my choice to end my human life is a tragedy because I have my, my light, my light needs to be here. If, if the world doesn't have me, there's an essential piece missing, same with all of us. If, if your unique self, who you are, your vibration is not here, Something's missing. The tapestry of life is not ever going to be the same. You are, in your humanity, hugely important. See, I think what I think is that we're here to experience life no matter what. Everything comes to us, and the pain and the joys. And, you know, we talk about this every Sunday that life just comes. And um, sometimes it's happy, and sometimes it's sad. And ours is to be able to be with it all, you know, be with every bit of it. And if we end it, we continue that, you know, because it's lessons. So the next, there's more lessons. And I think, you know, the film we show kind of shows that a little bit. I remember with um, my mom and dad always battled, you know, they were <laughs> battled back and forth. They just bickered for 50 years and got divorced and still bickered, you know, for another mother <laughs> until they died. And um, I remember after dad died, mom was still angry, kind of bitter, you know, about things and stuff. And um, I remember <laughs> saying to her, mom, you know what? You know, you there's not much time left. Dad's gone, you know, and you're old. <laughs> you know? Well, I didn't say it that way. I didn't say you're old, but, you know, she knew what I meant. 
And, and the truth is, is that you've got to come to terms with this feeling that you have about dad because, you know what, things are going to be the same, you know. They, you're over there. The next side, you're going to be dealing with it, maybe in a different person or whatever, but until you come to peace. And I really do believe that, that whatever comes in our life, the pain that we're all dealing with, that we have to, come, have to um, face it and feel it and then let it move, move us into spiritual transformation because that's what pain is about. It's about spiritual transformation. Everything we experience, and, and you know, deep depression is, is a big one. It is a big one, and sometimes I think it's important for us to indicate that, like uh, your statistics indicated, sometimes, you know, we are bodies, we're humanity, we are these biochemical, physiological things that um, sometimes don't uh, hold together quite well, that, that have imbalances, and sometimes these, you know, clinical depression or whatever goes on here, these are real things that, that happen to our physical selves. So we have to deal with that. So there, there's that aspect. There's also that aspect of just depression or, or situational things that happen. And I, I want to share a little bit because I've been to this place and I'm still here, which is good for me because I'm glad I'm still here. But I, I want to share a little good bit because I want to share a little bit about this because um, I know a lot of your stories and I know that sometimes we get to that place where we think life is just too hard where it just, we can't see the light beyond the circumstance that we're in. Does anybody, you know, I don't need any nods of heads because I, this is a delicate thing and you may not be willing to be as transparent as I'm going to be. Many years ago, so now it's been like 27 years ago, um, I was in a very unbelievably difficult work situation. Um, it, it was a situation that involved rape. It was a situation that involved shame and guilt and um, a fear, it was a mess, it was just a mess. And I quit drinking. Prior to that I was drinking, pounding down, you know, coming home not even using a bottle at the end, 28 years ago, a glass. It, I mean a glass, and just figuring the, whipping out the Stolich Naya right out of the freezer, right, because that was the way I was dealing with this pain, right? I was in such a situation that was, it just looked so dark to me, I could not see. So I quit drinking. Oh, brother, that year, that year that I wasn't drinking and was in that situation, that was so difficult, so horrible, pushed me to the brink of thinking, well, I just, I'm going to end this. I'm done. I don't see a way out of this. I'm hopeless. I can't tell anybody about this. This is a big this is, it's horrible. It's, I didn't tell a soul. Didn't tell a soul. Think about that. Didn't tell a soul. That's where we get with these things, right? Didn't tell anybody. And I really seriously was at that place, that, that choice point. And my daughter said, guess what? We're going to have a baby in our family. Hope was still in the box. Hope was still in the box. And I thought, hmm, maybe... I don't have to end my life right now. Maybe there's a way around this. Still didn't tell anybody. <laughs> Still didn't work through the problem. Still had the same situation. But I came away from that, that edge of the Golden Gate Bridge, and I didn't jump. And I stayed in that situation, and it remained the same, but I wasn't ready to kill myself. And the turning point, the turning point came when I met a person who happened to be an attorney, this became a legal matter, who listened. I felt safe. I could tell the story to a real neutral person. I felt safe, and guess what? It all shifted, and that was the beginning of my personal spiritual journey, I think, that just brought me into this deep reverence for life, this deep understanding of the pain and suffering that we all go through. We all go through it. And it's given me a new perspective of what this journey, this human journey, is about. So I, I get that we can be pushed to the edge of pain and suffering and want to make that leap. I get how that is. Through grace, I didn't have that biochemical aspect that clouded everything, like Robin Williams did, that didn't allow me to make a good choice. Does that make sense? So I, you know, I know that some of you have been there, and you're, and you're here. 
and you found someone to talk to. And I think that's so important. Yes. Um, okay, let's just do another question. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, that's, you know, very, um, these things are hard to, to share, and, you know, you're so transparent about it. Um, okay, go ahead and read one of yours if you have Okay, something. how can we be there more authentically for each other and create a, an open, loving environment? Hmm. Well, I, I, I think it's, it's um, places like this that help. I don't, you know, um, when we can open up ourselves to other people anyway and just be, be together so that you create a safe place for people that want to share, you know? I mean, it, and it takes courage, you know, it takes courage to come here, I think, um, when you don't know anybody and to come and sit and to really reach out and, you know, you don't know if you're going to be, you know, hopefully people will be kind, and but you don't, you're not sure. But I think it takes each of us to reach out to the people that are new, right? And to just open your heart to somebody that might be sitting, you know, at a bus stop, you know, wherever you are. Open your heart to other people, you know. Um, I don't know. I, what, what, do you, what would you say? Well, I think part of it is as as a being, and that's all I can do is take care of, of how I show up and, and try to demonstrate um, for myself and for people that come in my energy field what it, what it could look like. For me, it's about non-judgment. It's about being accepting. It's about not, you know, um, not blaming, not shaming, not making people feel guilty, trying to be fully present with whatever uh, story is, is being presented, and not minimizing, you know, somebody's story, um, like, well, your story's nowhere near as bad as so-and-so's. You know, not even having that in my mind, that the pain and suffering that each one of us has is is big for us if it's big for us. Does that make sense? And so I think that the capacity to simply be present with each other in a very willing way to not, you know, and, and I have to admit, there may be something inside of us that gets triggered if we hear a story that is over, the, you know, really hits us where we're vulnerable. Mm -hmm. But to be able to be present enough to know that about ourselves and then create that loving, open, accepting environment that lets the person be who they need to be and not, probably a lot of it is similar to what my experience was. You're afraid to tell anybody. You're afraid someone will judge you. You're afraid that somebody, um, you know, nobody will understand. So let me ask you, would it have been different then? If some, what could, what, if you're feeling that way, what could have somebody done, a family member um, or a um, friend, you know, what, you know, to open you at that time is you know is there anything? I guess is what I'm asking, um, because that's a hard that's really hard when you're so close and and how do you open up your heart? You know, and, and I guess it's just you know everybody's different. You know, and who knows? Well, I I think that had I been in a place like this, perhaps where yeah, but when where there's an openness and it's it's okay to be vulnerable, where it's okay to to let your guard down, where it's okay to not be perfect. But see, you faked it, didn't you, probably? Oh, yeah. Because, see, I, I, I had the kind of a story like that. I, I wasn't as low as you, but I faked it. And this next question kind of is like that. It's like, how, um, how could you know um, that a friend or a loved one is depressed? And I think that's important for us to know that because, um, you know, I put on a face, too, um, you know, for a long time where, you know, happy, you know, and inside I can remember um, and it says here, what are the signs? And one of the signs was, uh, for me, was this like total gray. That's how, the only way I can describe this is that it's a heavy gray feeling. And I can remember walking to the, um, pushing the grocery cart, right? And it was just like every step, I felt like it was in mud. And you know, it's like there, it's a, it's a icy, for me it was this icicle that ran through my body. And that was my inside, but it's hard. Um, because, see, on the outside, you know, I, I guess my close friends, they knew, I, and there were a few people that were there, thank God, that helped me through this, but everybody on the outside would think I was just this friendly, you know, wonderful, happy-going person, you know, but people don't know, so it's hard, you know, when, if you don't share, but, you know, so that's the message is to, you know, find somebody, find a couple of trusted friends when you're starting to feel that way, and if you notice your friends are acting differently, you know, they're isolating. That's the number one is isolation. When you don't uh, go, do the things you used to do. 
you know, then something needs to be talked about. One of the things that I, I discovered in doing a little bit of research is that when somebody's really, really having a difficult time, the coping styles that most people use are one of three things. Um, sleeping, which would be the isolating. Yeah. Retreating, staying in bed, pulling the covers over the head, not, you know, not wanting to engage with the world, just totally withdrawing into the safe place because it's out there it's too scary. So this, this sleeping thing. The other thing is um, use of alcohol, drugs, overdoing prescription medication, running through life on this flat, um, sort of loaded, zoned out, uh, which worked for me until it, until I stopped drinking and then, then everything else happened. But this idea of this, this masking. And then the third thing, of course, is, is reaching out for help in some way that often shows up as suicide, suicidal, you know, thoughts, tendencies, whatever. Um, so I think we, you know, when we are in a community, in our community, uh, I know our team, if we don't see somebody for a while, guess what? We're going to reach out and say, are you okay? Are you okay? Because we, we you, the pattern gets broken, you see, and, and we're missing you. And we, we are going, well, maybe there's something going on here. So it's, you know, may not be depression, but it, it may be some physical illness or whatever. But, we, but the, when the pattern changes, I think it's important uh, with friends. Uh, yeah. And just to recognize, or, or seriously, if they're overdoing it and, you know, over medicating, drinking, whatever. Yes, yeah. Um, okay, but we have another one. How to remember, how do we remember our purpose in life? Purpose, yeah. oh, like how, the, no, actually, this is a different question. How do, remem how do we remember our purpose later in life? So I'm getting that this is from one of our beautiful sages, or somebody that's heading into sagedom. And <laughs> that'd be old age. <laughs> hey, let's just tell it like it is. At our age, we have nothing to talk about. <laughs> I know, I know. I mean, you know. When my grandmother was 68, she was ancient. I don't feel so ancient at 68. <laughs> So what was the question? How do we remember our purpose through our entire life experience? Because things change, don't they? Yeah. Things change. We're on spiritual journeys. Even if you're in your 30s, 40s, 50s. Now, now that's young to me. Um, things change. How do we remember our purpose? So I guess the first thing we have to decide is what is our purpose? Well, I love what Eckhart Tolle, because that, that, I live by him, and, he, and he's got inner and outer purpose he talks about. But all of our purpose, he says... And I totally get this. Is is to um, know who you are. It's to be interconnected to something bigger. That's what our purpose here. That's why we're even here on Earth. And I believe this with all my heart. I know we all believe something different, but I think we're pretty much are. You know, um, we are, we believe the same thing. A lot of us that. You know, there is this incredible divine within each of us that run through every cell in our body, and when we are connected to it. You know, then it, it dissipates some of these feelings that we're feeling, or, or it maybe maybe it embraces them. You know, but it helps us get through. And when we are connected, we walk differently. You know, we think differently. We we, we are connected, and that's what our, our job is: is to be with that higher part of ourselves and to take it with us wherever we go. Our outer purpose now is whatever you're doing in the moment. That's what he says. So your purpose right now, if you're listening, is to listen to us with, with presence, okay? Or listen, to, or, or, or sit next to the person you're sitting next to right now with presence. So it's whatever you're doing, do it with presence. So it doesn't matter exactly what you're doing. I mean, you know, you probably have a smarter answer, but that's what I would say. No, no I don't, but I'm going to call, at, we're, believe it or not, we're out oh. of town out of time. Um, I'm going to refer to Eric Butterworth, my favorite metaphysician, yeah. and he says, our purpose is to be the, act, the unique expression of the activity of God. So each and every one of us is that unique divine expression of the activity of God, that energy that God is, and we show up uniquely, and we are here to shine our light and to let our light uh, 
trickle down and out and flow on everybody else and to uh, just be that be that divinity in act in action that's what I think our purpose is so it doesn't matter how old we are my Janie she's nine she's my granddaughter her purpose is no different than my mother's who's going to be turning 90 this coming Thursday awesome it's the same purpose the same purpose they are called to be the unique expression of divinity wherever they are doing whatever they're doing and that's each and every one of our calling and that's each and every one of our purpose it doesn't matter how old we are and if everybody knew that if everybody knew that the truth the, the purpose of who they really are you know do that that connection we ne- we wouldn't be having this conversation that's right there wouldn't be depression there wouldn't be um, suicides because we would be so filled with the magnificence of life you know and so it is on the <laughs>